Rachel Bell, and this is Your Last Meal, the show where celebrities share stories about the foods they love most, and we dig into the history, culture, or science of those meals with experts from around the world. Today on the program, comedian John Early. I first discovered John when he starred in the HBO show Search Party, which I might even rank as one of my favorite TV shows of all time. Definitely top 10. He has an HBO comedy special called John Early, Now More Than Ever, and he is currently on tour, on tour now, performing all new comedy and cover songs. I caught his show last week in Seattle. John will talk about some of his earliest food memories, growing up the son of two ministers in Nashville, Tennessee. To me, the main experience of church, the entire objective for me was just Krispy Kreme. And I'll chat with professional etiquette expert Lizzie Post, great-great-granddaughter of Emily Post. We discuss when it's okay and when it's not okay to send back a dish at a restaurant. All right, let's get into it with John Early. I don't want to start on a negative note, but I Googled you and two or three John Earlys died this year. <laughs> <laughs> I I think I've seen that in my Google alerts. I did a John Early Google alert years ago, which I really should stop. But I have gotten the obituaries sent in. On the same note, there is a John Early Middle School. And when I looked where it is, it's in your hometown of Nashville. Were you, are you, is this, did they name it after you? Did your parents name you after the school? It's so crazy. No, they didn't. I, the school's not named after me either. It's really bizarre how I spent my whole childhood knowing that. And yet I never went to the school to get a, for like a photo op in front of the yeah. sign. I never did any research about who that John Early was. It really belies a lack of, a deep lack of curiosity in, <laughs> in me. I don't know why. What I do have is a really cute t-shirt from that school that says like John Early um, Chorus. Oh, nice. It's really cute. It's way too small, but I love it so much. I guess, you know, growing up in a different time before the internet, we weren't as much into research. Like, what were you going to do? Like, go to your encyclopedia and look it up? Exactly. Like, get the microfiche going. Oh, God, those. <laughs> yeah. Well, also, you might not want to get too involved because the school had only two stars rating on Google. <laughs> Well, that's Tennessee public education for you, but you know. Mm -hmm. So both of your parents were ministers. Um, I'm curious yes. what your childhood was like. Did you grow up in the church? Yes. I mean, they were Presbyterian ministers. Um, by the time I was like, you know, conscious, really, they had stopped working full time as ministers. But we went to church every single Sunday. And I swear to God, I'm not trying to tailor it to your podcast. But to me, the main experience of church, the entire objective for me was just Krispy Kreme. After church, there was this thing called Fellowship Hall. Where, and you would go to this like kind of cafeteria type space. I need this. I'm Jewish. Explain to the Jewish girl how this works. <laughs> I, I, I think every church has something like this. And I think you know, synagogues do too. I think it's like, you know, you just go and eat and have coffee after the yeah. service. But um, there just was this long stretch where some volunteer was bringing Krispy Kreme. It made the incredible, like, blood level boredom of church all worth it. The crippling boredom. It and was the, so boring. So it boring. was so boring. And when you, and with Protestant stuff, it's like there's not even the kind of like release of music or dance or like speaking Snakes. in tongues. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You're just, it's very just like there's a cap on it energetically. But sometimes there'd be Krispy Kreme. So church to me is all about just like the hunt for Krispy Kreme. But then it just kind of stopped. And then people would get these like kind of Kroger brand, not fresh donuts. And I would be so upset. <laughs> would you be sitting in the pew like your pupils were two donuts just circling around and around? Yes. Well, please pander to the theme of this podcast. I was going to ask you about that. Like if you guys went out to breakfast after church. Uh, I really do have food memories with church. Like, first of all, whenever they would do some sort of special church picnic or something, there was a woman 
in my church who made cheddar cheese grits. Ooh. And it was like her special recipe and she would make them in bulk and it was unbelievable. And I really do like, I do feel like that is the beginning of like what I love in food is like cheddar cheese grits, like big slices of tomatoes, mm. just like with salt and pepper. That is what I remember so vividly. Now we also would go to <laughs> this kind of, I don't know why I find this funny. <laughs> this like proto Whole Foods Trader Joe's called Wild Oats. Do you remember that? <laughs> No, we didn't. Have, I grew up on the West Coast. I don't know why it's funny to me. It's just like, it's so sweet. There's something so sweet about these kind of like 90s health food chains. Yeah. Before it was like, it had fully merged with culture and just become the standard kind of, you know. Just for but pun's it, sake, I wish there was like a sewing store just to the left of it. It's yes. like, should we sew our wild oats? <laughs> I maybe there was, you know, uh, but there was we would go there and get pimento cheese sandwiches. Very Southern, very Southern. And it would be like this very beautiful wheat bread, like kind of like a honey wheat, really dense, fresh Mm. bread. And then like literally like three inches, not three inches. That's probably a lie. Like I would say one and a half inches flaccid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like were you uh, measuring from the base of the bread? <laughs> no, in between, in between okay, okay. one and a half. Of the, okay. Sorry. No, your joke is brilliant. I just, I was, so You're like, I'm hungry. No. I'm hungry. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are not yes standing. I'm starving. <laughs> um, but it was like between the bread, it was like an inch and a half of pimento cheese. Wow. Like which sounds insane. And then a thick slice of tomato. And I that like, to me is like a perfect sandwich. Was the bread untoasted? Yes. I think people always are looking for different textures, but sometimes you just want mush and it feels like your teeth would just Sink right through all that. Exactly. I'm so absolutely starving right now. It's hitting me. No, this was a bad time. You should. No, no. I stand. think it's. I think it's good to come into this podcast starving because you're much more attuned to your food desires. I don't know because I'm Jewish if this is something that you did at church, but my entire childhood, my sister and I were obsessed with the wafer on the tongue, and we oh would my pretend God. to do it with like Ritz crackers all the time. <laughs> And we would put our tongue out and pull it back in like it was like, <laughs> like a little assembly yeah. line. Did yes. you guys like have those around the house? Were you eating like Jesus wafers for snack with cheese? Well, this is what's amazing. We didn't do wafers. That's not amazing, by the way. Um, but we, um, I, I don't know if wafers might just be like Catholic slash Episcopalian. Okay. Um, but I'm not sure. In In my Presbyterian church, we did white bread like little squares of white bread oh like you do to a duck exactly and often it was homemade by this woman in the church named daphne who was like Mm. a true angel she had the light of the lord in her honey daphne would do by the way she's still alive i don't know i'm talking the past tense uh well she doesn't do this anymore every like Christmas Eve service, she would come up and recite the Christmas story from the Bible oh, cute. from memory. It was like fully from the heart. It was a sweet and we would, and everyone cries when she does it because everyone loves her so much. She's a librarian. Oh my God. She must have the best handwriting. I'm just, I, I bet. <laughs> but she would bake the bread. It was like white bread. And it was kind of sweet. Mm. It was so good. And then they would pass around these little tiny glass, like kind of shot glasses of grape juice like a little thimble yeah and so that was also thrilling because you were also like as a kid you're bored and hungry yes and it's just it's a really clear activity and there's food and it's sweet and like that was huge and then as i got older we just did the thing where you go up in the line and you rip the bread there's someone holding a half of a loaf and someone holding a goblet and you rip the bread and i'm like do you dip it I think you dip the bread in the grape juice. Okay. A lot of churches do the sip. Yeah. And then the the priest like wipes the cup. But I think that's too like carnal or something. You know, it's like, yeah, it's like Protestantism is a little more sterile than that, you know? 
Because I was thinking it'd be cute if they put it in a big punch bowl. And like when you go to a tiki bar and there's like 35 straws and every, they light it on fire. <laughs> yes, yes. I know. Have fun with it. Communion wafers or Eucharistic hosts have a very unexpected and, if you love breakfast, important place in culinary history. Approximately a billion years ago, the wafers were made by pouring and pressing a batter between two hot sheets of metal. Can you tell where this is going? According to Mental Floss, in medieval Europe, the Catholic Church started making a bigger wafer that you could eat after meals as a final blessing. The metal plates would imprint elaborate images of Jesus, crosses, entire biblical scenes onto the wafers, which were very bland. But at least now, they were cute and bland. Artisans asked the church if they could make their own wafers, so they started selling their own secular versions of the wafers, printed with things like family crests and scenes from nature. And as time went on and spices like cinnamon and ginger arrived on the continent, people started getting chefy. They added butter and cream to the batter, leavening agents that made the final result tall and fluffy. Eventually, these wafer irons transformed into waffle irons. This is how the waffle iron was invented. They started making square waffles with the classic waffle pattern we know today. Everybody knows that waffles are good. So they spread throughout Europe to Germany, Belgium, France, the Netherlands, where they were eaten as a handheld afternoon snack or dessert, but they were never eaten for breakfast. Cut to hundreds of years later when the Dutch brought the waffle iron to America and we became the first to top them with maple syrup. When is it okay to send back a dish at a restaurant? Who should pay on the first date? These questions answered when we return. Your comedy partner and good friend, Kate Berlant, she has tried to train you to send food back at restaurants. <laughs> yes, this is this has been happening since the very, very beginning. And she still is has not been successful. So that must be something that she does. Often? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, often. <laughs> uh, sometimes to me, it's not that I think Kate even likes sending it back. I think she, what she more likes is the process of deciding as a group, whether or not she should send it back. (laughs) (laughs) And there have been like full dinners where it's like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. You know? And then we're like, do it. And then she's, she's like, we're paying a lot for this meal. Like this is not, I'm I'm going to do it. And then she's like, I'm not. And then they cut the waiter comes and then she freaks out. (laughs) <laughs> and then she doesn't do it. And then like, you know, it's just, it's a, you know, this is like the kind of Kate and I dinner becomes kind of theater and, and it becomes yeah. like, it's our, it's our grand theft auto. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's where we experience like the stakes uh, in life that we don't experience in our kind of lives otherwise full of malaise. Well, there's, there's like a couple debates within this that I have thought about and talked about with friends. Number one, this has happened to me. You're like talking shit at the table and you're like, God, this is, I don't, this is, I don't like this. And then the waiter comes over and goes, how is it? And you go, great. Yeah. And cause I go, does he really want to know? Uh, no, there's no know. option. You have to just say it's great. And then similarly, this is the, uh, the kind of reverse lie, which is when you go, you know, what's the rigatoni amatriciana like? Is that good? And they go, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like they're never like, they're so, it's so rare that you get a waiter that actually states her preference. But when they do, I become immediately loyal to them. Oh you know, yeah. They, or when you're trying on clothes, if they tell you it doesn't look good, it's like, do you want to move in with me? It's, it's like instant love. It's crazy. Yeah. This just happened to me this week. My friend and I were out to dinner at a place that I've been to many times that I love. The food is usually very good, but the salad we ordered was so salty. So salty that neither of us wanted to eat it. But it was an expensive salad and I wanted to eat it, but we didn't say anything. And at the end of the meal, when we had a different server, 
She remarked that we didn't eat any of the salad. So my friend finally spilled the beans and told her it was because it was too salty. And the server said, you should have said something. We would have taken it off your bill. Instead, she gave us a free chocolate chip cookie. But after hearing that, I wish that I would have spoken up. This is the other debate. When can you send something back if you don't like it or if there's something wrong with it? Because like right. it's one thing, like I had a seafood dish where there was sand in it. Like that to me feels like a clear cut. Yes. But if you're just like, I don't like this, can you send it back? No, that is part of the social contract is it's a risk. Dining is a risk. You're putting yourself in the hands of the chef and like sometimes it's not going to be to your taste. You know, it's not going to be a good night. I feel like this actually mostly applies to cocktails when you're like, can it be less sweet? And then they're like, absolutely. And then they send it and it's like super, super sweet. That's and also it's like cocktails. I'm a little like they're so overpriced. I, of course, I will drink the whole thing, you know, when, no matter what <laughs> like the your nose. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll ask for another and I'll like send compliments to the chef. But like, if I hate, even if I hate it, but like, but no, I think, I think food that's just like not great. You can't sit back. For you as an entertainer and somebody who's like fairly ridiculous and fearless, what is it for you that makes you too nervous to send something back? I just, I, part of what makes me an entertainer is that I'm a people pleaser, you know? Mm. So like it's, it's hell for me to come across as like, you know, snooty, especially if you, if you have a killer rapport with the waiter, which is always the goal with me. Yes. And Kate. We like do our tight seven up top, <laughs> you know, and then we're like, they love us. We're in, we got that, you know, yeah. and then, and then so the, to then crush that by being like, we actually like, that's too painful for me. This is so relatable. John and I share an opinion on when it's okay or not okay to send something back. But I wanted to get an expert opinion. Lizzie Post is co-president and author at the Emily Post Institute. Emily Post was my great-great-grandmother, and she wrote her first book on etiquette in 1922. And in 1946, she founded the Emily Post Institute so that the work could carry on throughout her family. She, she really wanted the family to carry on the work. And so we luckily have each generation since her has wanted to do the task. Um, but it's really an interesting job. You kind of get to have a finger on the pulse of American behavior and manners and um, all the while kind of having a constant beat of being aware of other people and self-reflective of how your own uh, actions impact them. What is the official Emily Post etiquette on when and when not to send something back at a restaurant? So I think that if something is off, chicken isn't cooked all the way through or something tastes sour when it shouldn't, fizzy when it shouldn't, um, these things uh, are definitely an indication that you just want to signal to someone politely that you'd love someone to check the dish for you. I think that's a really polite way of acknowledging that it might be something you're unfamiliar with that's supposed to be that way. But, you know, it also acknowledges that you're saying, I'm unfamiliar with this. This isn't striking me as correct. If there's something in your food that shouldn't be, that likely didn't come from you. I have long brown hair. If a long brown hair ends up in my soup, it's likely mine. Like, <laughs> even if the server has long brown hair, too. I think in that moment, I have to be responsible for the fact that that's one where it could very likely be me or... So I think those are those are some of the ways you you weigh it is is how bad is the damage is something going to make me sick but those are the kinds of things that we think about in that situation. So when shouldn't you send something back? I don't think you should send something back when you just don't like it or it wasn't quite what you expected. Mm -hmm. um, I think you take a risk when you order out that something might not be to your liking. I've had that happen. I had a, a curry show up. It was gray with just like mushrooms and one sad little carrot in it. And it it was so unappealing. I was just like, I don't know what happened to this dish, but I'd rather not eat it. I ordered it. And if this is how it's supposed to look, I'll take I'll take it and order something else and pay for two dinners. Yeah. But I'm not eating this for dinner. It's not going to be like something I'm going to enjoy. <laughs> So was that a case, though, when you use curiosity with the server? Did you say, I'm curious, is this supposed to be gray? Yes. 
like asked first, is this what this dish typically comes out looking like? The Mm -hmm. answer was yes, which did surprise me. And I was like, good to know. Thanks. I think I'm going to order something else as well. Like no, no need to comp it or anything. Like I straight up said to them, like, I'm not looking for a freebie here, but this Mm -hmm. is not what I wanted. Um, And so, you know, (laughs) I ate it on that one. (laughs) (laughs) Or maybe you didn't. (laughs) You didn't. Yeah. (laughs) We live in such a different time as far as etiquette is concerned. Very few people set a formal table anymore, except for maybe on holidays. What are the questions you get the most about etiquette related to eating that are modern issues? But I think some of the issues that I've heard come up around the table more often lately are things around diets and how to deal with something that's a true allergy, safety concern, or religious uh, restriction. There's a lot of push and pull between hosts in terms of like, I just want my friends to like eat the food I cook them. Some of them are in the camp of like, I'm the host, just eat what I serve you. And other people are in the camp of like, I am the guest. I do not want to eat things I don't want to eat. Like, you know, it's really interesting to look at the pressures in the relationships. <laughs> I would say dietary restriction is is one of the big ones along with... um surprisingly seating. We hear a lot more couples really wanting and advocating for and not understanding why there were old school etiquette rules about separating couples at the table and not having married couples sit together at the table. Oh, I didn't know that people did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the thing. You you engaged couples were okay because they were kind of going through this time and it was nice for them to like be together and talk uh-huh. about stuff. But if you were married couple, you really were, you were split up. Same with boy girl order, which today doesn't function as well. You know what I mean? And the idea that people had to have dates at dinners, you can have seven people around a table and still have a lovely time. It doesn't have to be even numbers. It doesn't have to be split between the sexes. You know what I mean? (laughs) Well, speaking of couples, I have a question because I feel like I am the minority in my opinion of this. What is the etiquette around who pays on a first date? And I guess, you know, we're talking heterosexual dates. Should the man pay on the first date? I personally don't ever expect for someone to pay for me on the first date because I feel like you don't know me. You don't know if you want to go out with me again. You don't know if I'm going to go out with you again. Like you can buy me dinner when we decide we like each other and it kind of means something. But I feel like otherwise it's not fair that, you know, (laughs) the men have to keep paying on maybe a bunch of first dates that never turn into anything. But (laughs) I'm always surprised that so many of my friends, all who kept their name when they got married and, you know, are card carrying feminists still say, (laughs) if he didn't pay, I, I don't know if I would go out with him again. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's a fabulous question. For a long time, we've always said whoever does the inviting does the paying. Mm. So not so much just the gentleman pays for a lady, but really in any relationship, no matter what it is, if you're inviting, if you're saying, I would like to treat you to or take you out to or have you join me for, I think those are languages that say, I'm trying to take care of you for this. I'm trying to create that kind of space and environment. Um Outside of that, I think it is so smart to talk about it when you set up the date. I personally am in your camp. Like, I like the idea of a first date being a split or you do something that doesn't even involve payment. That way you could just, like go for a walk somewhere, you know, like I, I like that kind of stuff because I think it just takes it out of the equation. But I like your idea of you don't know me. You don't know that like if it's truly one of those like a blind date or, a you know, we met online somehow and are choosing to meet up in the real world, like and haven't really talked much at all. I love your perspective of you don't know me. This is a first time just to see if you'd want to do something. And I loved the way you let the specialness of being taken care of be something that someone who has started to develop affection Mm -hmm. for you or Mm -hmm. developed affection for them to let them into that space of creating that dynamic. I just think that the dating world would be well served with a lot more of that. So thank you for sharing that. that (laughs) Really well put. Thank you. I will play this for all of my friends and say, I'm right, which will take away how nice and polite I was like five minutes ago. And that's the other thing is some people are like, I don't want to feel like I owe you anything. And if you treat me to dinner, 
I'm going to feel like I owe you even just a thank you. And I might not want to give that like, cause as you say, I don't know you yet. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I love the concept. Thank you for talking about <laughs> it. It's not what I was expecting. But like- <laughs> I want to know what you think. Who do you think should pay on a first date and why? If you are a straight woman and you think a man should pay for the first date, I'm honestly curious to know why. I have a poll up on my Instagram stories right now. You can find me at Hello Rachel Bell. Let me know what you think. Okay, when we come back, John shares his last meal, a dish that neither of us can properly pronounce. But we're trying our best, okay? We'll be right back. Do you guys ever read The Grub Street Diet? It's a long-running feature in New York Magazine where they ask actors, writers, musicians, chefs to write about everything they ate over the course of several days. But it's not just a list of their meals. They write entertaining essays that give you a window into how they spend their days, their habits, what their tastes are. This is right up my alley. I love looking in people's fridges. I want to know what every friend and coworker had for dinner last night. I just want to know. And in case you think I'm nosy... I'm not. I'm a culinary anthropologist. Anyway, the reason I'm bringing this up is because John Early wrote the funniest Grub Street Diet I've ever read. I'll put a link in the show notes. And when he wasn't eating a bagel at craft services or mediocre flatbread at a film premiere where he spotted Judge Judy in the crowd, he was eating delicious sounding food at restaurants and cooking at home. What do you like to cook? Well, I'm going to try to say this without answering my last meal question. Oh, okay. Let's just skip to it. What's your last meal? Well, so this is my last, okay. I, you know, obviously I really struggle with this as I'm sure all your guests do, but like the last meal that I chose is something that I cook. It's like the thing I cook the most, which, mm-hmm. and, and, be, and I know that that's crazy. It's like, you should probably choose the thing that you can't cook that's so good. But I do feel like it's more poetic and and emotionally resonant (laughs) to cook this because it's what I cook for myself out of comfort. It's also what I cook for other people when I'm just trying to make something quickly and it's really cozy. And it's also something that I've cooked most memorably in my mind when I've gone to like a cabin somewhere Mm. and like I'm getting like, not even the best version of these ingredients, but it's like <laughs> the way I'm edging right now. I'm not I know. telling what it what is. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Well, time's up. Time's yeah, up. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you can get like the kind of like, you can get the non, you can get like the non-perfect version of all these ingredients and it can still be so cozy, but it is yeah. pasta. And I don't know where to put the syllable I kind of don't want to know Emphasis. anymore. I changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, Amatriciana. Okay, yeah. I would, uh, yeah, I never Amatri- know. To, I don't know how to say it either, and I always mumble it. Me too. I get so panicked, and I yeah. make a big joke out of it in restaurants. But I, I here's what I know. The evolution of the pronunciation. I used to say Amatriciana. I really have noticed recently when I hear Italians say it on Instagram, not in real life, they say shh. Amatriciana. Let's look. A M A T R I C I A N A. Amatriciana. For people who don't know, what is in that dish? Well, it is kind of canned tomatoes, guanciale, which I think is the pork jowl. Yeah. Cured pork jowl, a little bit of red onion, crushed red pepper, olive oil. Sometimes people do it with tomato paste, sometimes they don't. Sometimes people don't do it with red onion, but I think like the, the, the essential traditional ingredients are canned tomatoes, red onion, guanciale, crushed red pepper, and pecorino romano. Mm. That's the sauce. And then of course it's on pasta. And I feel like the trend right now that I'm seeing for the past few years in like LA pasta world, New York pasta world is rigatoni. But what I, do but you like? Can, 
Well, I, I, I'm such a little millennial, you know, it's like whatever, I think Alison Roman did it with rigatoni. So I'm like, yeah, rigatoni. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Cause when you were saying that I was thinking of Alison Roman and Bicatini and that's what I thought you yes. were going to say. Yes. I think she did it. Well, that was my first, the first time I ever had it was with Bucatini. And I cooked it with that for years, but then I did it with rigatoni. It was just much more manageable, the rigatoni. Mm, less slurping. So yeah. how did this become your signature dish? I think that I had it at... The Olive Garden. <laughs> I think I had it at, oh my God, so fancy, Felix. I've been dying to go there. That's Venice. like top of my list. I don't know how it is now, but when it first opened... I was like, you know, when I first moved to LA, I really was like kind of stunned by the food. I loved pasta. I've always have <laughs> love Italian food, always have who doesn't. But like, I really was like, oh, I'm understanding now. I think like how, when it can be really special. And I had, I had that at, um, at Felix, the guanciale was like popping. Mm. You know, it was like so crispy that when you bite into it, it's like so light, but there's like a, it's, it's just, you know, pork fat, crispy pork fat. There's like a tanginess to that pasta yeah. that really rocked me. And I'm a Southerner too. So it's like pork and tomato is huge in Southern cooking. So I yeah. think there's something about it that feels like very, it brings me home, honey. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and it's one of those dishes like that's one of those four roman pastas that yes. people have said these are the four pastas of rome where you kind of have to get like the technique down and if yes. you can the best ingredients because it is only four ingredients so you're going to taste everything yes like pecorino is a very strong flavor yeah. and like really quality pecorino is Sometimes, like it sometimes is like a sheep's, yeah, like ass. I'm sorry to say, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's like barnyardy. Whoa, yeah, <laughs> and like that with the guanciale, like there's so, like some there's something about that dish that is like very farmy. Yeah, yeah, and like and that can sometimes be <laughs> repulsive, <laughs> but for for my experience of it is that it, it makes it feel very comforting and and kind of humble. And, and again, I, I have lots of memories of like being in upstate New York or in like, you know, in the mountains of California or in North Carolina, like cooking it like on vacation, mm -hmm. you know, and it, and in like the woods. And yeah, so it's, I... it's very loaded. For his last meal, John Early wants, oh God, now I have to say it, Amatriciana. That's not so bad. A pasta dish that is believed to have originated in the Italian town of Amatrice, two hours from Rome. According to the town's official website, quote, the only ingredients in a true Amatriciana sauce are guanciale, pecorino, white wine, San Marzano tomatoes, black pepper, and pepperoncino. This was a defensive statement made in 2015 after an Italian celebrity chef told the world on national TV that he added garlic to his sauce. <gasps> the town's deputy mayor told The Guardian, quote, it changes not only the flavor of a dish, but also the history of it. If you use ingredients like garlic or onion in an amatriciana, it means you are ignoring a pastoral tradition that is almost 1,000 years old, passed down from generation to generation. Please no one tell this man that John uses red onion in his sauce. John says his love of cooking in a cabin somewhere out in nature comes from experiences he had with his family growing up. And so that's still what you like, a cabin, nature, and cooking. Exactly. That's my ultimate vacation. And when you go with like friends or a partner, does everybody cook or are you the main cook usually? Well, I, everyone cooks. The friends or partners that I travel with, so, like I, I choose friends and partners that cook. Yeah, totally. <laughs> we totally. love to cook. And that was John Early's last meal. Thanks, John. Take care. Thank you so much. It was so fun. So fun. Bye. Bye. 
go see John's comedy show. There are jokes, there is singing, and he is on tour right now. You can find a link to his schedule in the show notes. Special thanks to Lizzie Post from the Emily Post Institute. She is still writing big, fat Emily Post etiquette books, including their latest, Higher Etiquette, which is all about pot. Now that marijuana is legal in so many places, she figured people needed some etiquette around it. The book covers topics like how to bring it to a dinner party or give it as a gift and how to behave at a dispensary. I love this for Emily Post. You got to stay relevant, kids. Your Last Meal is a product of Seattle's Cascade PBS. This episode was produced with Maliha Syed and mixed and mastered by Sarah Bernard. Original theme music by Prom Queen. I created, host, and co-produced Your Last Meal. Tune in to The Leftovers next Thursday to hear a speed round with John Early. When you were a kid, you had a Tony Collette fan appreciation website. Yes. If she was coming over for dinner tonight, <gasps> what would you make her? Oh my God! <laughs> Make sure you're subscribed to Your Last Meal so you never miss an episode. If you happen to be in Seattle on November 13th, I would love to see you at my cookbook launch. The book's called Open Sesame, 45 Sweet and Savory Recipes for Tahini and All Things Sesame. I'm Rachel Bell, and this is Your Last Meal. Your Last Meal.